Thank you very much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be both part of this project uh, as a, uh, a collaboration, and it's a real pleasure personally to introduce it because my first ever encounter with World Press Photo in Amsterdam was in 2004 uh, when I came as a guest. And uh, Fred Richen gave the Sem Presser lecture that year. And in the Sem Presser lecture, he presented this idea that he called Four Corners how to use the web to make a still photo interactive and provide layers of context to it. And I was uh, working in universities there and always interested in the story behind photojournalism and the events and issues it depicted. And I thought this was going to be quite literally an earth-changing opportunity that people would adopt straight away and would build straight away. That turned out not to be the case. And here we are 12 years later, but here we are to present actually uh, the building and presentation of this uh, capability. Um, the turning point for that was actually last October at the Image Truth Conference at Columbia University organized by Nina Berman and Gary Knight, uh, which brought a lot of people together. And I was there along with uh, Lars Boring, the managing director, and after a fantastic day and hearing once again Fred's idea, uh, Lars said, let's do it. Let's actually make this happen. And then through a series of very fortuitous connections, personal, professional, and institutional, uh, we teamed up with uh, Jonathan, who we had known also for some time, uh, who at this stage was at the Open Lab at Newcastle University, which was also one of my former stomping grounds. So lots of histories came together and formed a really, really strong collaboration that has now actually been able to, in a surprisingly short period of time, uh, actually deliver us the very thing that Fred talked about in 2004. So I'd like to introduce Fred to uh, come up and make the presentation uh, of the Four Corners project. So the Four Corners idea is basically that the screen and paper are not the same medium. A lot of times we use web pages as if it's still made of paper. We still think of it in an older way. It's kind of you know, like the horseless carriage idea that we have horsepower in our cars, even though the automobiles don't have anything to do with horses. We often think of what we're doing now in the past as if it's still the same as the past. We use mouse and windows and so on and so forth. So because the screen allows multiple layers of information, I presented, as David said, 12 years ago, this idea that why don't we use the four corners of the photograph to hide different kinds of information with three goals. One is so that the photographer really is the author of the image. You just don't give the image to an editor, to a caption credit, to, to put a title under, to do what they want. You don't want it just floating around and people recaption it in ways that have nothing to do with what the photographer saw. It's supposed to provide context so the reader who's interested could find out more about the situation, just as we saw before with the World Press winner describing the antecedents to what he did. And also in doing all those things, it provides a certain level of credibility. The, an author is standing by the, behind the image. It's not just anonymous by a camera. And second of all, there's all kinds of context from which you can learn, and Jonathan will be pre presenting later on how to then join social media discussions and so on about it. So the idea was at the bottom left corner of every image, this would be a template, would be the backstory. The backstory would be the photographer, a witness, the subject, speaking about what really happened around the image, before it happened, during, whatever, after, the upper left is image context. It might be the image before and after. It might be a video of the scene. It might be, for example, the World Press winner of the little child going through the barbed wire. 10 years later, what they grew up to do. Are they live in Germany? Where are they? The upper right is links to other stories, maybe the article, Wikipedia, whatever it would be, a video that explains more about the situation. And the bottom right would have the copyright credit, information, caption from the photographer, as well as you'll see I put in a code of ethics too. So I'll demonstrate these things. So this started in 1984. I wrote a piece for the New York Times Magazine 32 years ago 
saying it, it was five or six years before Photoshop, it was already the Cytex machines, which were half a million dollar machines, and you could change pixel by pixel the image. And I was worried that we would reach a stage, if we don't do anything about that, where people would start to disbelieve photography, and it wouldn't be as effective as an eyewitness, a reference point for society. So I showed, for example, this was the uh, New York skyline at the time, and then using a Cytex machine, I changed it. This was 1.6 million readers. So if you see the uh, Eiffel uh, Tower ended up in the middle, I put in a traffic jam, the Transamerica Pyramid. If you look at the building on the upper right, I, I turned it around, the Empire State Building, I moved uptown, and then we ran the two pictures so the reader could see. I got three letters to the editor, 1.6 million copies, and nobody was interested in doing anything about what do we do with photography in the digital environment. So taking this image, the famous 1968 image of Eddie Adams, I'll just show you, you how it works. There's two or three, this is proof of concept, there are two or three versions. If you see the bottom right, I just put a little thing on the corner to say the four corners are working. If we don't accept that, we could do it another way. But if you roll over on the bottom right corner, you'll see a photograph by Eddie Adams, AP, the caption. You roll over on the bottom left corner, you get the backstory. So Eddie Adams is saying that he basically feels guilty about this photograph. He thinks the guy was basically right to kill the Viet Cong because he had just killed a neighbor, another colonel, his wife and six children, and he deserved to die. And Eddie Adams was very unhappy about this becoming a anti-war picture because he thought it was being misused. So that's one version of the backstory. The upper left here, you can see the picture before and after that famous picture. And if you click on one of the pictures, you can see what it looked like. So the picture doesn't have to exist just in 125th of a second. It could be over time. You're more like a filmmaker who could do things over time. And you, you could also, if you want, have a video in it this is a rough video, so if you don't like executions, don't look. But you could put it here. Where's the sound? 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 So it also gives another context. So we know often people disbelieve photographs. It wasn't like that. For me, after I saw this video, I was fairly convinced, uh, even more than before, of what had happened. If you go to the upper right, it's the links. Oops, sorry. What's going on? You see on the upper right the links, so you could click there to another video, to Wikipedia, to whatever you would put in. So the photographer or your delegate, your editor, your agent, whoever you choose, could then fill in the four corners. There'd be a templated system to do it, and you could put in things to contextualize it there. So we also did this then with this image uh, just last week. We wanted to see what it would feel like contextualized with the four corners. So in the bottom right again, you see the photograph by the photographer and the copyright. What we did with the copyright symbol, it may be hard to see from the back, is we made it blue in a square. If you make it blue in a square, this is one idea uh, that we're proposing, you could click on it and you get the photographer's code of ethics. So here it says, while all photographs are interpretive, as a photojournalist, I consider my photographs are meant to respect the visible facts of the situation I depict. I do not add or subtract elements to or from my photographs. That's the code of ethics I wrote two weeks ago. So if you're a photographer and you want to establish with the reader, this is my code of ethics, it's right there on the image, if you want to adopt that. These are propositions uh, for the field, like that. And then on the bottom left, you have the backstory. This we took from an interview with the photographer, you know, what she felt was going on, how it made her feel, and so on. Again, you could scroll down. On the upper left, we pick this image as the image context. As you see, this is the young boy, Aelin, and his brother. They both drowned at, at sea trying to escape. But to me, this image is the image that really affected me emotionally on top of the other image. The other image could be sometimes maybe a little generic. There's an anonymous boy. This is no longer an anonymous boy. He has a family. He has a brother. He's like us. He's like everybody. 
So it, it makes a more visceral human empathetic possibility in that image context there. Uh, and then the upper right, again, would be links to know more information. So, so far you, you get it. You know, it's the four corners. You can use it if you want to. You don't have to use it the way I'm, we're proposing right now. But I'm often asked, what's the difference between an amateur photographer, you know, with seven billion cell phones in the world, and a professional photographer? And we know there's many, many, many more amateur photographers than professionals. So people ask me, what do professionals do different? And one of the answers I think that would be appropriate is they use the four corners. They provide context to their pictures. They just don't make a lot of pictures like a lot of other people do. OK, so that's a sort of basic proposal based on 12 years. Now, thanks to Jonathan's open lab um, and Patrick and, and Tim and the different people who work there, we now have a working website. Um, I don't know, why isn't this moving? which you can all find here. It should work on cell phones, but it won't work in this room because the Wi-Fi isn't strong enough for so many people, except I'm told maybe if you're Dutch and you have a local connection. So I'm gonna show you now what the website uh, does. So we're switching over to the web. So this is a model that was built with just the last week uh, to show. So this is obviously a demo. Um, again, you know, you, the way uh, Tim, who's the, uh, uh, the guy who actually did the programming. It's a photograph. When you roll over, you see the four corners instead of that little thing in the right corner that I did. And again, you could roll over. It tells you the stuff. Here you could roll over. You get the whole backstory. It comes from you know, the, Time Magazine. You could click on Time Magazine and go to the original if you want. Here you have the way he did it this way. So you see the picture before. And then again, you see the picture after. And then again, it's the same video, which I won't show you again because it's hard enough the first time to see it, but the same one I just showed you. The upper right would be links. So for example, I'm clicking on a video. This is from an Australian cameraman. Anybody can be excused for killing an unarmed man. However, it happens in wartime a lot. General Luan wasn't exceptional in that. He killed uh, the man at Viet Cong in the full view of the public in the streets of Saigon. That was exceptional for a national police chief to do that. There was a reason, of course, from his point of view. Only an hour before he had learned that the Viet Cong had uh, swept over the police compound in Saigon and his best friend, who was a police colonel, and the colonel's wife and six children had all been killed. So, you know, it, this goes on for a while, but then that's another kind of information that you could work with. You hit the back button here, and you're back with the, with the image. So here, again, we did the same thing. And again, if you click here, you get the code of ethics on the photographer's name, copyright in this case, the same as I showed you before. Again, here you'll get the backstory, and here you'll get the image before with his brother. And then in this case, you get also the image after, if you want to. So the reader always would have accessibility. If your picture travels and is published in 37 publications, they may all give it different captions, but this stays intact. It never changes. You're the author of this. You contr keep control no matter where this image goes at any time. It's your control. And again, here you have different links. You know, here we did, uh, th this is the really important uh, piece from the Human Rights Watch, why the, uh, Peter Buchert, the director of emergencies, first shared by Twitter the photo of the boy, Alan Kurdi, who died, even though it's against many people's ethics to show dead children. He did it, and he explains why, so that gives a context in terms of the ethics and, and why, why you do what you did. My sense, you know, I was picture editor of the New York Times Magazine from 1978 to 82. I left because it was, it was too repetitive. It was a formula, you, you know, celebrities, this, that, the other. And it, to me, it got very, very boring. I didn't want to be part of that. That was 82, 84. I wrote the piece I just showed you, the coming digital revolution, how we prepare. And, you know, my bottom line, the, the recent book I wrote was called Bending the Frame. We have more potential now, more possibilities of communicating than ever in the history of media. It's actually better than it ever was before. 
But Marshall McLuhan has this idea, we're all going 150 kilometers an hour looking through the rear view mirror. And what I'm trying to do is to suggest that we look forward and decide in the digital environment, it allows so much more information, so much more linkage, so much more context. In terms of multimedia, it allows your photograph to contain video, sound, text, if you want it. If people don't want it, they don't have to do it. But in my opinion, it elevates the photographer from some, you know, when, when we did in, in Switzerland, Bill Ewing show, uh, everybody's a photographer now, we changed it to everybody has a camera now. Everybody's not a photographer now. But if somebody seriously is a photographer, this allows one the possibility of contextualizing, authoring, and getting a point of view across that's your own about the image. And we're hopeful that at maybe one point, World Press Photo, other uh, organizations will accept this as a standard. And this will be useful in terms of sustainability, the credibility of this medium that we all love so much. So thank you very much. I give these talk. I started giving these talks quite a lot recently. It's usually to people who sort of manage universities and they're trying to rethink their business model, trying to rethink how they can rethink education. Um, and the first thing I do, because they know I used to teach a photography class, is I, sh I show sort of famous people uh, that I photographed, and it's kind of just it, it just uh, secures my credibility. Uh, I'm not going to do that today. It's, uh, I, I can't think of a situation in which I'd feel more insecure than sort of showing photographs to, um, to sort of a couple hundred of the most uh, influential photography people in the world. So I'm going to tell you a different, um, different story instead. So I was a relatively successful editorial portrait photography. I had a studio in New York and I worked with Steve Pike and, we, uh, and it, was, it was good. But the truth is that I couldn't make that business survive. And um, in around, I think it's 2008, I was asked to, um, asked to write a class, a photography class. And I said I would do that. I really wanted to teach. I wanted to get involved. Um, but I would only do it on the understanding that it would reflect the things I was thinking about at the time. It couldn't be the, the lessons that I learned when I was at school. It just wouldn't be appropriate. And so the big question I wanted to ask was, what is a 21st century photographer when everyone with a, with a smart mobile device um, is potentially an eyewitness and a publisher? And the nine people in the room, because this was a brand new course, it was the first time it had run, the nine people in the room weren't the people who were going to give me the answers. I wasn't a teacher that had this information. So it seemed to make sense to put the class on a blog, which doesn't seem particularly radical now, but at the time it was. There was nobody else that was teaching from a blog. Within 10 weeks, um, over, almost 1,000 people had come to this class to, to, ask, to answer this question that we put out there. The second time the class ran, I asked, I asked a similar question again. And just shy of 10,000 people came to get involved in that class. Some of the people in this room have con contributed to that class. This is what it looked like on the blog. The third time the class ran, just over 35,000 people came to take part. And this is what it looked like um, online. It, it spilled well beyond the classroom. And this is kind of what it sounded like, if that makes sense. Because no one's allowed to bring a pen into the class. You have to tweet your notes. I would publish an interview that we'd done with, um, with a photographer or with a graphic designer or with an artist or with an author, someone who was dealing with this changing media economy. And um, we would all listen to it together. There are classes running right now using this model in the UK. And people would come together and tweet their notes. That dark spot in the, in, in the middle there, that Death Star, that's, that's a room on the ground floor at the back of a converted cinema in Coventry in the UK. And that's the classroom. And in the middle of it is me. In the middle of it is me asking this question to the people in the room. And all of those other people around the world are joining in this conversation. Between then in 2013 and 15, this is what the class began to look like. And after this, it got really big. A quarter of a million people in seven US cities in 2014. So um, that class would never have happened without Fred Richin and David Campbell. They were the meat in the class, and they still are the meat in that class. Um, they were the f it was Fred, Fred's book, After Photography, and David's blog that, um, that would be trying to wrestle with those questions. And so I was thinking, you know, what do I bring, what do I bring today um, to Fred's idea of the Four Corners? What did, what, did that failing, what did that photographer's failing business model teach the teacher? 
had to rethink what their product was and how to open out. Not Perhaps I wasn't, I wasn't the source of all that information anymore. I had to just frame a question and invite people into it. What does that teacher now teach the photographer? So if we bring one thing to Fred's Four Corners idea, um, then it is this idea of engagement. If, if Four Corners is an authoring and context tool, then Four Corners Plus, name still to be decided, um, it, it has to be a, an authoring, a context, and an engagement tool. It has to, be, it has to start from the, from the perspective that there are three stakeholders in every image. There's the photographer, there's the subject, and there's the audience. And it has to be the interface between them. It has to enable the audience, it has to enable all of them to interact directly. It has to move photography from being a call to action to being a key to action. So that people can engage with the issues and the protagonists directly through the image, literally. And so the audience can see this image, much as Fred just described, and then see the photographer's backstory just by clicking through. Or what about if they want to connect with the issues? They want to see where these conversations are happening right now. It's just it's, it's algorithmically, algorithmically so easy. They can click through and see this conversation happening in, for instance, Twitter, for instance, uh, Facebook, or, or perhaps dive straight into where the conversation is taking place and actually enter the conversation. What about the subject? So the subject should be able to engage as well, right? They should be able to add more media to this, to enter this conversation, to say they were there or they were just outside of frame over time. Maybe they add stuff that was from, 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 from the past, prior to this picture. And then the viewer, again, starts to, to read through these images, and they want to engage. So how would you engage? Because trust is a real big issue now. How do you actually believe this, the contributions that are coming in? How do, you believe, how do you believe it is that person? So one of the successes of the classes was definitely lowering the barriers to entry and then going where the fish already swim using other people's existing trust networks and leveraging them, not asking them to change normative behaviors. So you can log in with Facebook, or log in with the New York Times, or log in with Google Plus, or whoever. And once you've done that, maybe you just want to drill back. Maybe you just want to distill this noise, with every, this wiki-like noise, with everybody joining the conversation, back down to exactly what the photographer said, so you can just filter all of this now, this big story, like the big class, just through the photographer's trust network or just through your Facebook trust, trust network so that you can filter out a clear signal. And then how do you know that that picture you're looking at, and Fred just brought this up, how do you know that is the picture that the photographer actually took? So what about if every single photograph had a unique, had a unique fingerprint? And so when you looked at that image, you had a fingerprint, and then you see the fingerprint that the photographer had as well, and you can just match them. So you can say, yeah, this is definitely the, the picture that the photographer put out there originally, and I can verify that with these unique fingerprints. So I started with nine, nine people in a room on a brand new class, and that course was unlisted in the UK. Within five years, or well, within three years, it was 35,000 people. It went to a quarter of a million. And within five years, it's the, the last time I taught it, it was, the, it was the Guardian's number one course in the UK. It was nine people to start off with. There's, there's two, 300 of the most influential people in, in the photo industry here today. If nine of those people go here and want to join in and collaborate, then I think, um, I think we can do some, some really exciting stuff. I'm really excited about that prospect. If 200 people came, there's almost no limits to what we could do together. Because here's the kicker. Everything I just showed you is actually really, really easy. None of it's particularly hard. So the choice seems to me, we either, we either wait for Facebook or Vice or someone else to do this and to own it, or we do it. We do it openly and we do it together and we own it. And we become a really strong voice in what, um, in what it comes to mean. These are the people who actually made this. Uh, I'm just the person standing up in front of you. Thank you.